everybody. Welcome to another edition of Lab 207 Webcast. My name is Mr. Kite and I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about energy resources. Today's topic is going to be the future of non-renewable resources. So as always, let me get you some objectives and we'll get going. By the end of this video, be able to discover, not discover, discuss the Hubert curve and the future of fossil fuels, explain electricity generation using nuclear fuel, and describe the advantages and disadvantages of nuclear energy. So I want to start out by talking about the future of fossil fuels and kind of where we're headed and trends we've seen over time. Since the 1950s, if you look at this graph here on the right, you can see that per capita energy use, that would be energy use per person in a country, went up from the 50s to the 70s and then into the 80s. And following the 1980s, per capita energy use dropped and then it leveled out. Another measure that we can look at is energy use per dollar of GDP, which would be energy intensity. You can see that globally, energy use per dollar of GDP for a country has actually gone down since the 1950s. So we can look at this graph and say, sweet, the world is using energy more efficiently. Looks good. Problem is, as we talked about in previous videos, global population is shooting up dramatically. So even though we are using energy more efficiently now than we ever have in history before, each person or there are now more people on the face of the earth. So because there are more people on the face of the earth, then, you know, just kind of by extension, we're going to use more electricity or more energy globally. Also, as standard of living is increasing for people, we have more people moving into a lifestyle where they will be using more energy to support their lives. So even though we have become more efficient in our use of energy over time, overall energy consumption is still increasing quite dramatically because population is increasing as well. So by definition, fossil fuels are a finite resource. We talked about how they form, and we talked about the fact that they take millions of years to form. So because they take so long to form, that means that there is not going to be any more of them within a time frame that is relevant to our discussion. So by definition, fossil fuels are not sustainable. Something that is sustainable is something that you can use at a rate at which it regenerates itself. And the rate at which we use fossil fuels far exceeds the rate at which they are able to regenerate. So by definition, they are non-sustainable. So there was this guy named Hubert, and he tried to make some predictions about how long our current oil supplies were going to last. And he developed this curve that you see here on, this, on your screen. It's called the Hubert curve. And it predicts something called peak oil. Peak oil is basically maximum oil production around the world. And he basically said that oil use will continue until we hit peak oil. This would be peak oil right here. That would be maximum oil production. This would be the place at which the oil is produced, or the oil, the world is producing as much oil as it possibly can. Following this peak oil spot, production will dramatically decrease. And he used these curves to kind of talk a little bit about how much oil was left in the world and how long we could expect to exploit the oil reserves that we have available to us. So be familiar with the idea of peak oil, that would be maximum production. And then we can take that, that idea and apply it to reserves. Now oil reserves, or you could say fossil fuel reserves, are fuel reserves that have been proven to exist and to be um, accessible in a way that is economical, meaning that we can actually get to it in a way that companies can make a profit searching for it. So as far as reserves go, here's what we know. We know that we've got roughly 40 years of oil reserve. Um, that could change because technology is improving. We're uh, building machines that use oil more efficiently. So we might be able to extend that out another 10 or 20 years. But long story short, oil, it's going to run out sometime probably within my lifetime. If we're talking about coal, we got roughly 200 years of coal in reserve. And note that these estimates assume current consumption rates. So if our technology makes things more efficient, then these estimates could be spread out. Natural gas, it was said that natural gas reserves were, you know, just a little bit longer than oil, definitely short, shorter than coal. But um, recent advances in the technology for extraction of natural gas has changed those estimates. And you can see there on the right, the biggest oil reserves in the world are in the Middle East, followed by North Africa, and then there's some in Africa and Eurasia and Central America as well. So that's kind of where in the world the oil reserves exist. Now, the future. A couple things to consider when we're talking about the future of fossil fuels. So there used to be the discussion of, oh, we are going to run out of fossil fuels. So that is a big problem. 
To that end, technology has improved so that we are using fossil fuels more efficiently. If I think about it, you know, when my dad was my age, he was driving a car that got probably 10 to 12 miles a gallon. I now drive a car that gets 50 miles to the gallon. So that is a dramatic increase in the efficiency of machines, and that's through technology. But a lot of people are arguing that running out of fossil fuels isn't the problem we should be concerned with right now. We should be concerned with the fact that burning fossil fuels releases greenhouse gases, which dramatically increases climate change. So people are shifting from the we're going to run out of fossil fuels argument to hey, for the sake of the planet, we need to be aware of what we're doing with fossil fuels and figure out other ways of producing energy that are not nearly as polluting. And also, the future of fossil fuels is going to be dependent on demand. If demand shifts towards more uh, renewable forms of energy, then there's going to be less demand for fossil fuels. And as we're talking about future of energy, we want to talk about nuclear energy. Nuclear energy is kind of a weird thing in that it technically falls into the non-renewable camp because it comes from or it's produced using uranium, which is a mineral, it's a non-renewable resource, but it is highly efficient and pretty clean, so it kind of straddles the line between non-renewable and renewable, but know that technically it is a non-renewable resource. Um, it is considered to be a cleaner form of energy because when you are actually producing electricity using nuclear fuel, no greenhouse gas emissions are produced. It produces steam, and that is about all. So it is considered to be a clean form of a non-renewable energy. To understand how nuclear energy works, you need to understand this idea of fission. Fission is an atom splitting into multiple parts. Now, most nuclear energy is produced using an element called U-235. That would be uranium-235. And here's basically how the fission process works. So you start out with a big ol' uranium atom right here. You shoot a neutron at this uranium atom's nucleus, and the uh, nucleus of a uranium atom is really big and it's unstable, so it wants to split apart. When this neutron hits the nucleus, it splits up into smaller nuclei. When that split happens, two things are released. First one is energy. This energy is harnessed to produce electricity. We'll talk about that in a second. But it also releases more neutrons. Those neutrons go out and they strike other U-235 atoms, which in turn split up. And you can see how this quickly becomes a chain reaction of nuclei splitting, releasing uh, heat energy and neutrons, those neutrons going out and splitting more uh, nuclei and so on and so forth, giving you the energy that is used to produce nuclear energy. So essentially here's how a uh, nuclear power plant works. And, at its base, it is very similar to any other thermal power plant, so like a coal power plant or a natural gas power plant. But basically, here's how it works. In the middle of the power plant, you have got the reactor core. The reactor core is where the nuclear fuel is stored. You take the U-235, the uranium, and put it into rods. Um, these are called fuel rods. And these fuel rods hang out in the middle of the reactor core. The whole uh, reaction core is contained in a containment structure. This is to house any radioactive radioactivity and keep it from escaping into the environment. So as these uh, fuel rods go through fission reactions, they produce a ton of heat. That heat heats up water which is going to be passed through a heat exchanger, which is this thing right here. This water that goes through is super hot. It heats up this water, causes this water to boil, which gives us the steam, which turns our turbine, which turns our generator, which gives us electricity. The water that runs through the reactor core is recycled over and over again. So the big challenge with nuclear energy uh, generation is that left to their own devices, these fuel rods will rapidly go through that cascading effect of fission and run out of control, causing a meltdown. So you need to be able to control the rate of the reaction. The way that you control the rate of the reaction is with control rods. A control rod is made out of a substance that absorbs neutrons. So basically what you do is, let's say these are your fuel rods. You've got your control rods up here. And control rods are raised up from or lowered down into the reactor core. So if, let's say, the engineers want to slow down the fission reaction, they will take these uh, control rods, they will lower them down into the reactor core. Since they're down in the reactor core, they absorb some of the neutrons that are being shot off, 
which slows down the reaction. If they want to speed up the reaction, they pull those control rods up, which means the neutrons are not absorbed and the reaction can run more fully. If they want to shut the thing down altogether, they just take those control rods, they put them all the way down, and that absorbs all the neutrons, which shuts off the reaction. Also, this core is surrounded by water, which also absorbs some of the uh, nuclear energy that is being released. Now, as far as where nuclear energy is produced, um, the biggest producer of nuclear energy in the world is France. They get 70% of their electricity from it. A lot of Europe has um, been very successful at producing nuclear energy. Also, China and Japan use it. The USA gets about 20% of, of our electricity from nuclear energy. So Europe, Asia, France, USA. France is part of Europe. But those are the places where uh, nuclear energy is more commonly used. Now, the advantages of nuclear energy. We're going to go advantages and disadvantages and then be done. As far as the advantages go, like I said in the beginning, uh, there's no air pollution associated with the actual electricity production of nuclear energy. So the only thing that comes out of those big old cooling towers that you can see there on the right is steam. It is highly efficient. So obviously there's going to be uh, energy and pollution associated with the mining of uranium ore to get at that uranium and the uh, purification process of the uranium. But if you control, like if you compare megawatt hour for megawatt hour, uh, nuclear energy produces 2 to 10 percent the emissions of coal. So this means that making electricity using coal is 90 percent more polluting than making electricity using nuclear energy. So those are the things that people point to when they say, hey, look, nuclear energy is not a bad thing. The disadvantages, and these are the things that people talk about a lot, um, the waste. Anything that comes into contact with that radioactive material is uh, it becomes radioactive. So this could be clothes, tools, anything used by workers in the plant. Obviously, the uh, spent fuel rods themselves, we'll talk about those in a second, are highly radioactive. So all of this radioactive waste has to be dealt with in a special manner because it can't just be decontaminated. You can't incinerate it. You can't just ship it off to somewhere. It's got to be dealt with because radioactivity is highly dangerous to humans. So that's the big thing is how do you dispose of the waste? There is also concerns about terrorism because the fuels that are used to run nuclear power plants are the same fuels that can be used to make nuclear weapons. So the waste that comes out of these plants, um, a lot of people worry that if it falls into the hands of terrorists, that some significant damage could be done with that. And also there's the danger of meltdown, which is a catastrophic failure of the power plant, and I'll talk about those next. So there have been three major nuclear accidents that you need to be aware of. The first one, 1979, Three Mile Island, Pennsylvania. Um, a water valve was shut off. So water did not make it into the reactor core, which means that there was a partial meltdown of the plant. Meltdown is where the uh, nuclear reaction starts to run out of control. Um, the Three Mile Island accident was really more of a PR scare than it was a nuclear disaster. A lot of people got scared. There was evacuations, but there has not been shown to be any like health consequences that came along with the Three Mile Island accident. Now, very different, 1986, Chernobyl, Ukraine. There was a severely botched uh, safety test of the nuclear power plant in Chernobyl, which led to a catastrophic meltdown and explosion. When this explosion happened, it released a ton of radioactivity into the atmosphere and thousands of people uh, died of radiation poisoning. Cancer rates in the area are still extremely high. There's an area around the Chernobyl plant of something like, I don't know, I think the radius of the area is 30 miles or something like that, where people are still not allowed to go back into the area. There are ghost towns around Chernobyl, Ukraine, that have just been completely abandoned. So this was a really, really big meltdown that you need to know about. And like I said, it was the result of a terribly botched safety test that led to the meltdown of the uh, power plant there. And then in 2011, um, the earthquake in Japan damaged the Fukushima power plant, and that power plant, their reactor core got damaged. It started leaking uh, radioactive materials into the groundwater, out into the ocean, and it also released some radioactivity into the atmosphere. They are still dealing with this one. Um, the reactor has been shut down, but they have been finding that it's still leaking radioactivity into water supplies. So that is an ongoing concern with the Fukushima power plant in Japan. And finishing up, this is the last thing that we're going to talk about for the day, um, the radioactive waste. I want to talk about this a little bit more in depth. Um, 
So, like I said, the fuel for nuclear power is uranium-235. It has a half-life of 704 million years. Quick reminder on how to calculate half-life. Half-life is the length of time that it takes for half of the radioactivity of a sample to disappear. So let's say that we have got a sample that is 100% radioactive. After one half-life, 704 million years, it is... 50% radioactive. After another half-life seven, of 704 million years, it is 25% radioactive, and so on and so forth. So obviously it takes a long time for radioactive waste to decay. Um, scientists have said that uranium U-235 waste is not safe to be around until 10 half-lives. So that is obviously much longer than humans are gonna be around. Presently spent fuel rods are stored in very deep pools of water that uh, limits the spread of radioactivity. However, most of the storage pools around the world are now full, so uh, radioactive waste is being stored in lead-lined containers, which absorbs the radiation. But this is the biggest problem with nuclear energy, is the radioactive waste. A couple of proposals have been put out. Um, Yucca Mountain in Nevada was proposed because it's got a huge series of ca caverns. And people just said, all right, well, we can fill those caverns with the radioactive waste. It'll contain it. We can secure the area, and it'll be good to go. Politically, that wasn't something that people were up for, so Yucca Mountain is still under debate as to whether it could be used for the storage of nuclear waste. As I mentioned previously, there is the concern of terrorism. Radioactive waste that is not secured could be uh, stolen and turned into uh, nuclear weapons. And then storing things in the future is always a big problem because while nuclear energy is very efficient to produce, it also creates this highly, highly dangerous waste that we have got to deal with. And nobody really knows where in the world we can store this without, while it's you know safe for humans, doesn't damage the environment, isn't accessible to those who might want to do bad things with it. It's a difficult topic. So... That's it. Future of fossil fuels, nuclear energy. Thanks for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite. Hopefully we'll see you again.